Welcome to another edition of We Need to Talk About Movies. Brought to you by Banterflix.com. And now, here's your host, Jim McLean. Hello, hello, hello. Yes, I am indeed your host, Jim McLean, the editor-in-chief of the Banterflix Movie Review website. Welcome to the latest episode of We Need to Talk About Movies. If this is your first time checking out this podcast, then welcome to the madness. I say that every week. But if you've been checking us out now for a while, then thank you for supporting the show. If you don't know what the pod's about, the clue's in the title. Each week we talk about a cinematic release. It might be a new film, it might be a cult classic, it might be a movie you've never heard of. But I gather together some contributors and we chat about the film. Sometimes we get a little bit spoilerific, but we try to have a bit of fun in the process. And uh, we hope that you enjoy it as much as we do you know, making the thing. But uh, yeah, that's what we're all about. This week, we are doing something slightly different. At the end of October, during this year's London Film Festival, I got a chance to speak with the director and one of the writers and presenters of a new documentary that screened during the festival and has recently screened on the BFI player and will be screened on the BBC next year. That is Rob Lemkin and Femi Nylander, and I'm going to be speaking to them about their documentary, African Apocalypse. And before we get into that interview, let's play a clip of the film. When I got into Oxford, there were more old Etonians in my year than black students like me. It was here I began to plan a journey to research the imperial history they didn't teach at school. What will I find out? Niger, the UN says it's the world's least developed country. I'm relieved to have a military escort. They tell me that because I'm English, I may as well be wiped. My name is Femi. I've come really to find out more about the history of colonialism. This national highway follows the exact route of the French colonial massacres. Depuis des années, depuis que j'étais petit, je prenais cette route. La plupart ignorent l'histoire de cette route. I discovered the savagery at the heart of Western civilization. This is typical of Europeans in Africa at the time. The British in Sudan, the Germans in Namibia, the Belgians in Congo. What made them believe African lives were so expendable? This supremacy still haunts our modern world. You can only be free for a bright future if you are free from the past. So I'm joined now by Rob Lemkin and Femi Nylander, and we're going to be talking about African apocalypse. Guys, can can you start by telling me this is this is coming from the Joseph Conrad novel Heart of Darkness? Can just for the the uninitiated, this is this is something that forms a very big part of the the basis towards the documentary. Can you tell our listeners and our viewers a little bit about? that source material and why it becomes relevant to this documentary. Uh, yeah, shall I do that, Femi? Yeah. Heart of Darkness, yeah, go ahead. Heart of Darkness is written by Joseph Conrad in 1899. Uh, it's set on um, the River Thames and it's the, tells the, and it's a story told on the River Thames by a man who's gone off to uh, Africa, a uh, place that probably is the Belgian Congo where a huge amount of atrocities were being done at the time, although in, 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 in the book, it's actually, uh, it's, it's just an unnamed country. Mm. And he goes up the river, um, let's call it the Congo River, to collect a man called Mr. Kurtz, who works for uh, a, a Belgian ivory trading company. So he's right in the jungle, in the thick of the 
uh, right into the interior of the country and he's extracting huge amounts of uh, ivory and he's doing an absolutely amazing job, but he's also going very, very, uh, becoming extremely violent and murderous and almost creating his own independent, uh, as it were, kind of like kingdom and kind of controlling the Congolese people in this way. So this man goes all the way up the river to collect this guy, Mr. Kurtz, and then brings him back. But he realizes that when he meets him, that actually this guy, Mr. Kurtz, has gone into a very, very strange place, which is almost like a metaphor for the way that Europe has treated Africa. And that's kind of the story of the, of the book is really about how does this, uh, the person, the Mr. Marlowe, who tells the story, how does he cope with meeting someone like Mr. Kurtz? And clearly, obviously, that whole concept of Mr. Kurtz has resonated massively because it forms the back about the, 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 the basis for the famous film Apocalypse Now, in which Marlon Brando plays not Mr. Kurtz, but Colonel Kurtz, and it's reset into the Vietnam War, and he plays a man who's gone up again the river, this time it's the Mekong River, into this time Cambodia, and has now done very similar things to what the book, the man, in, the Mr. Kurtz in the, in, the, in the Joseph Conrad novel did. So it's a real archetype. It's like an archetypal story about how does... Europe, or how has Europe dealt with uh, other societies, other places in the world in this huge colonial epoch that we, we've been living in for the last few hundred years. So that's the, 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 the book that forms kind of the, the inspiration for this story. Femi, I, I feel like it's time to kind of bring yourself in and kind of talk to us about, you know, as I say, it's, it's, it's using that as the, the, the documentary uses that source material as a kind of inspiration, as a platform for this documentary, but it's mm -hmm. it's not about that. You know, can you tell her, I, I know we we want our viewers and we want our listeners to to see the documentary, and I will come back to that because I know it's screening at the, on the BBC later this year, but tell us a little bit about, because it, it's not about the, the Conrad source material, a bigger character at play here is Paul Villet. Can you just tell us a little bit about that character? And I suppose as well, like how you how you came to dis to discover him and kind of know uh, about him. If was that something that was from the doc being involved on this project, or kind of was that the catalyst for this project? Yeah. So there's a scene early in the film um, where I'm talking about different candidates um, for my cuts, and so Vule as a candidate comes from this project. I wasn't aware of Vule until I met Rob. Um, but I had been involved in Rhodes, who is listed as one of my mm -hmm. candidates for Kurtz. I'd been involved in the Rhodes Must Fall movement at Oxford University as far back as 2015. Um, and so um, we really, the idea is that Kurtz and Voulet, this is happening at the very same time. It's 1899, as, as, as Rob mentioned, for, for Heart of Darkness. 1898 is, is, is when Voulet is, is going out there. You see, you see this 1999. You have these, this very, very, so, so this is happening in parallel, the supposed real life Kurtz and, and the fictional Kurtz. Um, and the idea is to, 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 to use these, um, these, these individuals and this individual of Paul Voulet, who, who, whose, whose story is very, very, very parallel to the idea of mm -hmm. Kurtz. I mean, Kurtz um, kind of in the book goes, goes, crazy to starts seeing himself as an African chief and the rest. And this is literally what Vule was doing. He declares himself the kind of king of the Sahara and says he's going to set up his own empire um, in the um, Sahara to rival France's. Um, and so the parallels were too strong, I think, to not have a, a Heart of Darkness as a rhetorical device, which then brings you into the world of Kurtz, I mean, into the world of Voulet, and then Voulet hopefully bringing you into the world of, okay, well, Voulet isn't just a single individual um, who went crazy and had what, what, what some French officers at the time called pseudonitis, the idea that when, when, um, when, when French people go out to, to, to Africa, it's the tropical weather which just gets to their heads and makes, makes them go a bit crazy. And you can't blame the um, colonial atrocities on on France. You have to blame it on the African sun, right? It's the idea that it's not this 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 um th this this one off. It's it's really part of a systematic um, and um, Europe Europe wide um, 
system of exploitation and domination which exists to today and has not been um, aptly um, confronted by those of us in the Western world um, to date. Can I ask you, and I'll, I'll ask this to you both gentlemen, I mean, from, from listening to you there, Femi, you know, you could have had quite a few candidates to be your Kurtz for this documentary. And maybe this is me just putting two and two together here and getting five. It does happen. But was it a conscious decision not to have that character, that, that person from history from, from Britain? Was it? A, did you want to kind of move it out into kind of European to kind of show that this is not just this, this history and this trouble, problematic history we have with well, realism isn't just British? You know, it's it's European white. Well, um, maybe again, I'm putting two two together here and getting five. But was that a conscious decision, or was that something that you, you thought of for the project? No. So Rob had already been to Niger and done recon work in Niger by the time I was involved in the project. Okay. So it was always going to be um, Voulé. Um, but again, I think that yeah, the whole point. I thankfully I already spoke French to a to a decent degree, um, as you can see from, from this, a lot of the scenes and things yeah. are French. Um, I had to improve a bit, and I have improved more since filming. <laughs> um, so it wasn't perfect, um, and so 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 that was that meant that I could communicate with Asan and Amina, my guides. I learned a bit of Hausa going out there, but yeah, I think that this is good because of the fact that the film shows that the boundary between this is this is the border. This isn't the border between Niger and and Chad. It's not the border between two French colonies. It's the border between a French colony um, and a British colony, and it's dividing and splitting up and ripping apart Hausa land these people. And that is one of the things which we actually had more ideas about exploring in the film, but didn't quite make it um, to the cutting to the cutting table. They were left on the cutting table, even the ideas of the border between Nigeria and Nigeria and what it means to be a British Nigerian exploring the creation of the Nigerian border. um, But through the lens of 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 going to the French colony of um, Niger, um, I definitely think that. um, that, that, that Rob will have something to say on the fact that Niger and the story of Voulet was kind of had something to it that you that 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 that, that, that didn't necessarily come out in all the other stories of colonial atrocities that um, that, that that made it a unique um, way of doing a docudrama on colonialism. And I think you might have something to say on that, right, Rob? I mean, I think there was a yeah yeah. I sort of feel like in Niger. Obviously, Conrad, as he's writing the story of Kurtz and creating Kurtz, Boulay is actually enacting the same stuff. He's talking the same way. The lines that he's saying, which are recorded in the archives, in the accounts that are done at the, from the time, the lines that he's saying are lines that could have been from Mr. Kurtz. And it's almost like from the pen of Conrad out of the little nib and with the ink running in Kent while he's writing his book in a farm in Kent. Uh, you know, the, it's it's all dribbling across the world to, to to Niger, where this French guy is actually enacting it in some kind of weird, I don't know what, morphic resonance type of thing, where the world is all in touch with each other on some kind of weird level. But I think the reality is that if we've been able to find a story that resonated in that kind of way uh, with a British character, then we probably would have gone for it. But the reality was that the, the, the Voulé uh, was A, at the same time as, as, as Conrad, but also that Voulé uh, kind of in, in his own story, and because I suppose the trail of his massacres is, defines the country now, it defines the main road across the country, it defines the border of the country, it, as Femi was saying, all of these things, and he kind of, uh, you know, there were people who worked there, who told us who they worked, uh, this was a film, but who told us that, you know, white people in the 90s and 80s and 90s, if they were, um, uh, if they were, if they were working in kind of like uh, NGO projects, kind of aid workers and stuff, they would always be pointed out by kind of Nigerian people as being, oh, that's, that's Voulet over there, yeah. because, you know, Voulet was a kind of a, like a, uh, a bogeyman, like the, the, the white bogeyman who comes to make trouble. People, children were told, you know, young children in Niger were told, uh, behave yourself, otherwise Captain Vule will come and get you. So Vule has sort of taken the hold of the whole of this country mm. in a, through his individual kind of personality in a way that 
maybe other stories we couldn't find one so and also it's a not a very well-known story so by of, of, by definition it's kind of always interesting to hear a story that you don't know yeah there's two things because just I do want to come back to Rob kind of talking about how, kind of how you kind of discovered about how you dis- discovered on earth the kind of story of really but just on what you said it's just throwing it out to both of you gentlemen there's a really powerful moment in this documentary where you're talking Femi to school children and they're talking about mm-hmm. that and it, you can see kind of and it's a big thing you talk about in this documentary about how the past can still have a direct effect on the present and just kind of like your thoughts and kind of fill in something like that where you I suppose you're very aware you, you are the outsider but you have to be sensitive and there's a there's a powerful moment I know again where you kind of talk about you you, vi- 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 uh, you visit a village and you kind of talk no one has ever asked us about our story before our past so that sense of I suppose being delicate in kind of how to kind of approach and kind of get this openness from not only children but from adults as well yeah so there's there's so there's there's um there's there's many occasions on which you you have to ask um questions that people are going to i mean i mean uh, you you know the answer is going to be pretty intense when 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 i ask the girls have any of you lost any relatives and then you get the very very direct and br- brutal story from one of the girls of how how her um how her family was affected by the invasion. Um, the past for them is very real. This isn't, um, and it's the same thing that my guides tell me um, when when they kind of confront me about my, my Zen-like stoicism. They say, look, you're not getting this from university. It's not coming from textbooks. It's not coming from um, from from a lecture. It's, it's, it's real oral history directly from the mouths of the people whose grandparents and great-grandparents um, this this happened to, um, and it's oral history which has not yet been recorded from their perspective. It's been recorded sometimes a little bit from the perspectives of the French troops who travelled, French officers even, who travelled with Voulet, um, trying to justify the idea of empire. It's been recorded in, in, in Club's, Club's diary, but we've not heard this, this direct oral history from these people, as they say, they've never been asked about their history. And I think that's the important thing about um, doing a film like this. It's about not having, centering it around the the presenter, not centering it around the, the um, Western perspective. It's utilizing the platform to give uh, these people the chance to, to, t- to tell their story, especially if they've not been given the chance to tell it before. Yeah, because it's, you know, there is no denying, you can read as much as you want, from a history book, but to see things firsthand and to hear things firsthand, there's no denying the impact that they have. Rob, I, I did want to mention, and I know that we are pushed for time uh, with this interview, but uh, just very quickly, you know, Remy mentioned, Femi mentioned that you had, um, you'd come to this project. How did you discover the character of Vule in kind of researching for this this film, this documentary? Well, I'd started off by well, from the premise that um, I was interested in trying to somehow make a film that was like kind of universal film about kind of colonialism, not something that I'd made some films at the BBC that were very sort of specific about British imperial activities in Malaya and in Burma and stuff. And those were specific stories. I really wanted to do a much wider thing. And I thought that Heart of Darkness was really a very, very kind of um, sort of somehow had some key key to it so there's something in there that would mean that we could do something that would be quite universal and i think from reading around it i then came became aware of and you know reading various different sort of books and accounts of that period of that time just became aware of um this particular episode in 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 i didn't even know it was niger at the time i just knew it was somewhere in french west africa and that this guy vule had kind of gone uh really really kind of crazy and had uh you know had uh, killed a lot of people and also then actually been killed himself um because he'd gone so far over the top so i kind of felt like there was and the overlap of that i mean we weren't we only tried we, the decision to call it african apocalypse was quite recent but actually apocalypse now was always a film that was kind of lurking in the background and yeah, and I wasn't sure. I'll be honest with you. To be honest, not going to Niger, I wasn't even sure. When I first went to Niger, I was mostly scared about Boko Haram 
and uh, you know what was going to happen in terms of the security operation that we made to get to get across the country. I didn't. It was really only by going from village to village to village that I realised that actually this guy Rule just keeps on going, keeps on going in every village you go to, because obviously the journey that Femi makes is a kind of an improvised journey based on preparations that I had done before, so that a large crew and us, we could actually operate safely as we went across this country. But as you went from town to village to village to village to village, and this guy, Rule just keeps coming up, and he's just this, you know, actually, they don't know really anything about him, but of course, they he just symbolises the whole hundred and odd years of, you know, French domination of the country, and the fact that they've actually learned their schooling in French is because of him. And then finally, you get to the place, and there's this guy's grave, and it's still got kind of wrought iron railings around it in a in a in a square of a village where actually people are living in extremely kind of humble houses and eking out a life on like 50 cents a day and finding it very difficult to keep alive and you still have this tree and this grave and it's all kept as if it was like as still it was 1899 so there is a sort of extraordinary compelling kind of concentration of Vule and uh, and the his and these bigger histories of colonialism and bigger kind of forces that you know obviously in a film you can't do you need a kind of a unifying thing and I think Vule provided an amazing unifying character and force to be able to tell tell to, to, to be able to for Femi to be able to sort of go and kind of follow through. Yeah, uh, my last question, and it's very because I know we are nearly out of time. Is it's very quick. The film has just had its premiere at the London Film Festival. It's what's it's what's going to be its journey now beyond that? I mean, I, I think I read in the brief like this will be screened on the BBC. Is there a date for that, or is it just kind of later uh, this no, year? It's not going to be on BBC this year, um, but yeah, BBC Arena, which is a television series, is good. it will be on in that series um, uh, yeah, next year. Uh, but prior to that, it'll be released on BFI Player uh, on the 30th of October. And there will be screenings that we'll be doing. We don't know, of course, because of COVID, and we don't know what all these various tiers and restrictions are going to be. But You're speaking to someone where in Northern Ireland, we've our cinemas closed right now. You know, that's that's a joy for us. But, you know, hopefully, as you say, you know, we will get to see this on the big screen. Yeah. Gentlemen, thank you very thank you. much for your time this afternoon. Thank you, guys. Thanks so much. Thank you, Jim. Thank you. So that's my interview with Rob Lemkin and Femi Nylander about African Apocalypse. As Rob said, at the end of that interview, the film will be screened on BBC next year and uh, was recently screened as well on the BFI player. So uh, check it out if you get the chance. It's a really fascinating documentary. I thought it was absolutely fantastic. But uh, that's pretty much us for this week's podcast. Hope you enjoyed it. It's a shorter than normal edition. We'll be back next week with another pod, but for now, until then, goodbye. This has been We Need to Talk About Movies. Thanks for listening. For more information, visit banterflix.com. See you next time. <laughs>